Good afternoon. My name is Robert Thompson. I'm the Vice President of Programming and Corporate Outreach for the CFA Society of Atlanta. Um, we're thrilled to have this, uh, this seminar today, which is going to be uh, an online series. It's some potentially surprising facts about long-term stock returns. Um, I wanted just to briefly go through our calendar of events. Um, we are going to have our annual meeting for the CFA Society of Atlanta um, on June 15th. The, the topic is assessing the economic and mar market outlook uh, for the second half of 2023. That's uh, going to be held at the Battery in Atlanta. We hope you can uh, hope you can attend. Additionally, we have our annual volunteer appreciation event on August 10th from 5:30 to 7:30 p.m. And then we're really excited about uh, an in-person real estate market outlook panel, which is going to be held on August the 16th from 12 to 1 p.m. Please check our website for more details on these and other programs and register today. We'd love to see you. Um, just want to introduce our, 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 our panelists. Uh, we're joined today by Hendrik Hank Bessemender. He is the professor of finance and he holds the Labroya chair at the WP Carey School of Business at Arizona State University. And this panel is going to be moderated by uh, Rex Macy, who is a CFA, uh, CFP, and also the CEO of Red Tortoise uh, LLC. Um, you know, throughout the panel today, if you can, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature within the Zoom controls, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Rex to begin. Rex, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. Uh, let me add uh, that Dr. Bessenbinder, he has a PhD from the University of Washington, an MBA from Washington State University, and a BS from Utah State University. Uh, I should also add that, at least from my perspective, the highlight of his academic career were the years 1999 through 2001, when he was a professor of finance at Emory University. I came across his 2018 paper, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? That research prompted me to reconsider my thinking about passive stock investing. Until then, I thought that the cost advantage of index fund was their only source of superior returns relative to active management. Dr. Bessenbinder's analysis of the considerable skewness in the distribution of individual stock returns led me to consider that broad index funds offer exposure to the few big winners that portfolios with fewer holdings may miss. Intrigued, I reached out to the CFA Society of Atlanta, suggesting Hank as the speaker, and here we are. To reiterate what Robert said, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions. Dr. Bessenbinder, on behalf of the Society, thank you for sharing your work with us today. The virtual floor is yours. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Rex, and I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, share uh, some of my research findings with, uh, with uh, the CFA Society of Atlanta. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, I hope that came up appropriately. So uh, uh, as advertised, the title of the presentation, some potentially uh, surprising fact about facts about long run stock returns. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is present uh, some results. Uh, I have to kind of pick and choose a bit because of time. Uh, I'm gonna present some results from, from a series of studies about the long run outcomes in, in the public stock markets. Uh, so the original study uh, looked at 26,000 U.S. stocks uh, from 1926 up through, through the date of the original study, 2016. Uh, I'm also going to give you a little bit uh, of an update. Uh, I just posted uh, an updated study that goes through uh, 2022. Uh, I'm also going to uh, uh, fill you in a little bit on the outcomes of a uh, global extension of, of the original study to 43 countries, uh, 64,000 stocks. Uh, and then I'm going to just touch on, on a couple of uh, uh, follow-on studies. Um, so one of the punchlines is going to be that, that there's a few really successful companies out there that are they're basically driving the uh, equity risk premium that we're familiar with. Um, and everybody wants to know what is it about those companies. Uh, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about among observable companies. Uh, what is it that's empirically most important about, uh, about those right tail companies? Uh, and then uh, I'm going to show you some preliminary outcomes on the question of, uh, is it the firm or is it the CEO at the firm? 
And you notice the uh, uh, parenthetical that's uh, preliminary. I haven't uh, publicly posted that uh, paper yet. Uh, and it's uh, I'm in the process of, of updating it as well. But I thought you might be interested in seeing uh, some of the preliminary results. Uh, if you're interested in the papers themselves, the easiest thing to do is, uh, is go to ssrn.com and just search under my last name. There's uh, some advantages to having a, a relatively unique last name. All right, so let me talk about uh, the original study. Um, the title of the study was, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? Uh, now, I'll freely admit that I chose that title strategically to attract readers. Uh, my thinking basically was if you uh, pose a question in a title that everybody is pretty sure they know the answer to, uh, they kind of have to have a look to find out what is this person talking about. Um, as, uh, as Rex indicated, uh, the study is really mainly uh, about positive skewness, positive skewness in the distribution of returns. Uh, but I just have a hunch that if... Uh, if I had titled the study something like stock returns are skewed, well, it would have got some attention, but maybe uh, maybe wouldn't have been noticed by as many people as, uh, as noticed it with the, uh, with the title I chose. Uh, in any event, uh, it's basically about positive return skewness. So let me, let me recap uh, the findings of that original study. Uh, so first of all, if you just pick a random stock in a random month, it's more likely that it loses money than makes money. Uh, the second thing, if you compound returns over time, basically buy and hold returns, um, and I was using here the CRISP database that many of you will be familiar with, starts in 1926, uh, has the large, large majority of all the stocks that have ever been uh, publicly listed in the U.S. I just compounded their, their returns for the full set of time that they were, they were in the database. Uh, when I did that, the majority, about four out of seven, actually underperformed treasury bills. So if we think of comparing returns on, on stocks to treasury bills as a risk premium, uh, about four out of seven stocks had negative rather than positive risk premium in terms of their compound returns. Um, on the other hand, there were a few stocks that had very large compound long run returns. Uh, most extreme case was one stock that had a, a compound return of 220 million percent. Probably wondering who it was. It was Altria Group through 2016. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying anything new about what we know about the uh, risk premium for the overall stock market. Uh, those empirical facts are, are as they are. But if the overall stock market is, is generating a, a large positive risk premium in the long run, large enough that, that some people refer to it as the equity premium puzzle, if the overall stock market's generating this large positive premium and most stocks are underperforming, it, only, it can only be because there's a few stocks that are doing very well that are pulling the average, pulling the average up. Uh, I also... Uh, created uh, uh, what I think is, is a new measure, although the, uh, the uh, idea is certainly not new. Uh, it's basically measuring the risk premium in dollar terms instead of percentage terms. So I call this shareholder wealth creation. Uh, it's basically the, the increase in the wealth of an investor who held a position in a stock throughout its lifetime as opposed to the wealth they would have had if they just earned treasury bill returns on the same amount of capital over the same number of, same number of months. Uh, so just think of it as, as the ex post risk premium uh, in the stock, but measured in dollars and measured uh, at the end of the sample. Uh, essentially it's a net future value equivalent, uh, you know, corresponding to a net present value. Anyway, I measured this for every stock and then added it up across stocks. Um, I found that the wealth creation was uh, uh, notably concentrated. So there was about the, uh, going from memory here, about 35 trillion in wealth creation through, through 2016, but 90 firms, one third of 1% of the firms that had been listed accounted for half of that wealth creation since 1926. And the top four, 4.3% 4 accounted for 100% of the net wealth creation in the public stock market since 1926. So those were the, those were the central findings of the original study. Um, it attracted uh, a bit of attention. 
uh, certainly more than I than I expected when I when I compiled these uh, facts. Uh, when I first compiled uh, uh, these empirical facts, they were surprising to me. But my thinking was, well, other people must know this. Somebody must have done this before. Um, it seems that was uh, largely not the case. Uh, there had been some studies that that had uh, touched on aspects of this, but nothing so comprehensive. Uh, so it it, uh, it it generated some uh, some reaction. Um, let me jump to uh, the very newest thing that I've done, which is which is an update through 2022, and I'm focused in particular here on this uh, on the wealth creation measure that that I mentioned, the uh, ex post risk premium uh, measured in dollars. So uh, I believe you can see my cursor. I'll go ahead and use it, assuming assuming you can. Uh, the original study was 1926 through 2016. Uh, I then did an update. Uh, through 2019, and then most recently, I've done an update update through 2022. Uh, so, first of all, the uh, the net shareholder wealth creation number. Uh, to what extent are are shareholders in aggregate wealthier because they've been in the stock market as opposed to earning treasury bill returns? Uh, that number has continued to. It was not only large to start with, uh, large when I first compiled it in 2016, uh, but it's continued to grow. And, and despite the fact that 2022 was such a difficult year in the stock markets, uh, it, it uh, continued to grow. Uh, but here's what I, I mainly wanted to focus on, uh, the concentration of the wealth creation. So uh, let's focus again on the benchmark. How many, how many firms, if we, if we start from the best performing firm and, and just go from there, uh, what, uh, how many firms are necessary to explain half of that rather large dollar number of wealth creation? Uh, when I first circulated the study, the answer was 90 firms. When I updated in 1926, or sorry, when I updated in 2019, that was down to 83 firms. And with the latest update, down to 72 firms. So the message is that uh, while uh, the stock market in the intervening six years continued to generate a lot more wealth, the degree to which most of that was concentrated in a few firms has only strengthened since the original study was circulated. Uh, if we go to the question of how many, uh, how many stocks does it take to explain 100% of the net wealth creation, uh, in the original study, it was 1,094. In the 2019 updated, it expanded a little bit to 1,173, but it's now down to 966, 3.4% 3. 3 of the stocks. Um, one, uh, one issue here, this net shareholder wealth creation, I've computed a wealth creation number for every stock, and then I've added it up across all the stocks. Uh, I think that's the natural measure of interest. How did things turn out overall in the markets? Uh, but some people have observed, and they've got a point, that when you're computing percentages of a number that has both positives and negatives in it, uh, depending on the specifics of the situation, sometimes you can get to 100% really quick, especially if the net number is a small number, then the percentage of, of the observations necessary to, to explain that small net maybe, you know, maybe is not very informative. Now, we don't have a small net number here. We have very large net numbers. But, but with that in mind, here's another comparison. So the, the label I use here is gross wealth creation. So uh, what I did is just took the wealth creation numbers added it up only for those that had a positive outcome. So the difference between the gross and the net numbers uh, is basically the wealth destruction of the firms that, that had negative outcomes. Uh, but the main reason I did this is to show uh, it doesn't change the conclusion. So uh, the, the gross numbers are bigger, obviously, because we're only adding across those with positive outcomes. Uh, but if we turn to the question of uh, how, many, uh, how many stocks does it take to explain half of the gross wealth creation. As of 2016, it was 138. As of 2019, it was 121. As of the most recent update, it's 110. Uh, so same, same punchline. Uh, the degree to which the wealth creation in the stock markets is concentrated in a few top performing firms has only grown since I first kind of shown the spotlight on, uh, on that issue. All right, so let's uh, let's pivot over to the uh, the global 
study. Uh, so that was 64,000 stocks for 43 countries. Um, this was over a shorter horizon, 30 years. Uh, some of you have probably uh, uh, dabbled in, uh, in the data, uh, the, the available reliable databases for individual global stocks just don't cover as, as uh, long a time series as the, uh, as the CRISP data does for, uh, for US stocks. Uh, so this was over 30 years through, through 2020. So uh, um, the skewness point um, really shows up in, in pictures, in graphs well. So uh, uh, the comparison of this figure to the one that'll be on the next slide uh, 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 displays a lot. All right, so uh, 64,000 stocks over 30 years, there's, there's many millions of individual monthly uh, return observations here. So this is just a frequency distribution of those millions of monthly returns on individual common stocks. And you can see in, in the monthly return distribution, you can see a little bit of indication of positive skewness. Uh, some of it just from the fact that uh, there are outcomes above 100%, while uh, by definition, there's no outcomes below negative 100%. And you can see uh, just a tiny blip there at greater than or equal to 200%. So there's, there's a little bit of indication of positive skewness in the monthly return distribution. But if you come in here between, say, negative 30% uh, and positive 30%, where the vast majority of the outcomes are, as, as you'd expect, uh, it's pretty close to being a symmetric distribution in the monthly returns. It's not a normal distribution that, that we've known for a long time. Uh, there's, the, there's the fat tail phenomenon and the, the peakedness, peakedness of the distribution. Uh, but, but it's pretty close to being a symmetric distribution uh, where most of the observations are. So my point is, if, if all you ever look at is monthly returns uh, and describe them various ways, you're, you're never going to notice uh, the extreme positive skewness that's there. But if you start compounding the returns, and in each of the studies I've report results compounded for a decade and for the full, full sample lifetime, I call it full period that the uh, stock is in the database. If you compound the returns, things look different. All right, so uh, here's the same 64,000 stocks over 30 years, just compounded the returns over the whatever period of time the stock is in the database and plotted the frequency distribution again. And I think the technical term is that this is different from the previous one. So uh, uh, nothing symmetric here, nothing remotely similar to a, to a normal bell-shaped curve. So the most frequent outcomes for both U.S. stocks and non-U.S. stocks are returns in the vicinity of negative 100%. Uh, complete ruin or close to it is the most frequent outcome. Uh, no signs, no sign of a of a uh, uh, increase in the distribution around zero or anywhere that you could think of as the mean of the distribution, and a long, long right tail. I just graphed this out to nine hundred percent or ten x, uh, and then uh, uh, the spike here is for the percentage of uh, outcomes that were were more than than ten x. Uh, so uh, uh, if you only look at the monthly returns, you're never going to see the skewness. Uh, you compound the returns, uh, you uh, can't unsee the skewness, as they say. Uh, let me just uh, uh, slice the uh, results of the global study a little, uh, uh, a little differently. So uh, with numbers instead of uh, figures and also breaking it out by different samples. So uh, the full sample, 64,000 docs, as mentioned. Uh, they say, well, I've studied the U.S. elsewhere, so let's look at the non-U.S. part of the global sample. Let's break it into developed and emerging economies. Let's break it into regions, uh, Europe, Asia Pacific. I have Australia there just because last time I presented this a couple of weeks ago was in Sydney. So it was natural to break out Australia. So we've got, we've got all these stocks. For, for every stock, we've got a compound lifetime return. And then the rest of this is, is about comparisons across these compound lifetime returns. So for every one of the samples, on average, that's a nice, healthy, positive number. Uh, pretty much what you expect to see uh, on average, stocks generating a, a nice, healthy return. Uh, but if you look at the median, 
uh, for every one of these samples, the median is much less than the mean, which essentially is the signature of positive skewness. Uh, not only that, but the median is, is negative in every one of the samples. Uh, so uh, it's just another way of saying that more than half of the outcomes are, uh, are, uh, are negative numbers. Uh, in this column, reporting the percentage of the uh, stocks that, uh, that generate a positive return over their lifetime, always less than half, uh, generally between 45 and, uh, and uh, 49 or so. Uh, and then the percentage that uh, that beat UST bills, the percent that uh, uh, generate a positive risk premium, to use the the, the familiar terminology, uh, which is generally in the, in the low 40s. So the uh, the signature of skewness is just there very very strongly in uh, in the, the global data set. Uh, back to this point about wealth creation being uh, being concentrated. Um, let me just uh, uh, stop for a second and say, it, it's not a surprise that there is concentration in, in this thing that I call wealth creation. Uh, I mean, it would be really strange if you know, there were 64,000 uh, stocks and they all contributed an equal amount to, to wealth creation. Uh, we wouldn't have expected that for, for many reasons. The, the first one is just that there's big random outcomes in the stock markets. Some, some stocks are going to have randomly high returns. Some are going to have randomly low. That's going to give us concentration in, in wealth creation. Um, also, there's big firms and small firms. It is, it is a dollar measure. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, that, that's going to give us concentration. Uh, the same return applied to a big firm is going to give us big outcomes. Well, I might mention there that uh, uh, size and performance are are intertwined. Uh, you know, Apple was not a noticeably big stock when it was first listed. These days it has a, uh, I think what, 2.6, 2.7 trillion market cap. Almost all of that is performance, not that it was big when it was initially listed. Anyway, size, size and performance are intertwined, but still you have big stocks and small stocks. Also different amounts of time in the data. Some, some stocks have been in the data for decades. Some stocks have been in for only a few months. Anyway, these are all reasons that, that we should expect concentration in the wealth creation. The question I think is, should we be surprised by, by how much wealth creation there is? And, and I don't know the exact answer to that. I'm just documenting that it's, it's very concentrated. Anyway, so in, in the global study, uh, the top five firms account for 10% of the uh, uh, aggregate wealth creation. Um, the top 1,500 firms, which in the global sample is only 2.4%, so an even smaller percentage than, than we're seeing in the US data, 2.4% uh, of the firms account for all of the net wealth creation. And just to clarify, this, this was kind of implied by the gross versus net outcome. Uh, and, and this is something that, that sometimes uh, uh, creates a bit of confusion. When I come up with a number like this, 2.4% of the uh, stocks accounted for 100% of the net wealth creation. Uh, that, that's not saying that only 2.4% of the stocks beat T-bills. That, that's too strong a conclusion. Uh, so there, there's actually an additional 40% that beat T-bills by modest amounts. That other 40% generated just enough wealth to offset the wealth destruction or reduction of the majority. So 58% of the stocks underperformed treasury bills, net wealth reduction. 40% of the stocks generated just enough positive to make up for the 58% reducing wealth. So that the first 97, what are we at? 97.6%, the first 97.6% collectively matched treasury bills. And then all of the trillions of excess beyond there are accounted for by 2.4%. That's, that's what the numbers are saying. Anyway, quite a bit of concentration in the, in the wealth creation. All right, so uh, contributing explanations. Uh, you know, ever since I first circulated this, uh, uh, everybody wants to know what's special about those right tail, right -tail firms. Of course, what they really, really want to know is what's special, and can I predict them in advance? Uh, if you were, uh, if you came to the session today expecting that I would give you the answer on how to predict the right tail firms in advance, uh, you're going to be disappointed. 
Uh, so uh, what I'm presenting for you here is not is not predictive, uh, but nevertheless descriptive. So uh, I'm going to look uh, at some measures of, of fundamentals and see which fundamentals best explain firms ending up in in the right tails. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, this is a phrase that's been used in the press and at least one other paper. Uh, is this about superstar CEOs? Is there, you know, firms ending up in the right tail, is that about having the right the right CEO? Uh, got something something to say about that sort of thing. All right, so uh, uh, which observable variables? So these are things that a quantitative person like myself can sink their teeth into. So uh, things like measures of return volatility or historical skewness in returns, things I can measure from the return data, or things that I can pull from, from accounting data, like uh, income growth or asset growth or profitability, et cetera. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I had done an earlier study where I looked at 20 some odd uh, observable variables. And in the prior study, the ones that had come in uh, uh, both significant were income growth, asset growth, sales growth, and essentially average profitability, uh, income uh, scaled by, uh, by assets. Uh, uh, and I'm focused here on decade, decade horizon returns. Um, I'm going to mention again, this is the same decade. So this is descriptive, not predictive. Uh, the R squareds for anything predictive are really low, as you'd expect. You know, I, don't, I don't know if the markets are efficient, but I do know they're competitive. There's no, uh, there's no, easy, there's no easy route to, uh, to uh, big profits. Uh, so the statistical method here is uh, fixed effects uh, estimation, which some of you might be uh, familiar with under that name, or you might be under uh, familiar with it under uh, the other name, uh, ANOVA, analysis of, of variance. Uh, and this uh, should mention is back in in the U.S. stock return data. So uh, those five those five variables, uh, and that by the way, I, I think of the decade indicator as really just being a control a control variable. Uh, but these five variables collectively uh, explain, um, sorry, I need to move something to, okay. Uh, these five variables collectively explain 29% of the variation in stock returns at the, at the decade horizon. Then among these five variables in a statistical horse race, by far the winner is income growth, net income growth. Uh, the second one, is income to assets profitability. Now, I, I actually find this kind of striking that uh, uh, you know it's uh, it's of interest that there are some stocks that end up in in the right tail, but it's also of interest that among the observable variables, at least the ones I've been able to sink my teeth into, it's something so fundamental that has the best explanatory power: income growth. So which, which stocks end up in the right tail? Well, they're growth stocks, except we have to be a little careful how we use that term growth stocks. Lot, lots of people, lots of people use market to book ratios or valuation ratios to say what's a growth stock, what's a value stock. And uh, by the way, I looked at that. Market to book ratios have essentially, market to book ratios at the beginning of the decade have essentially no explanatory power. Um, so predicting right tail returns isn't about picking stocks with high or low market to book ratios, but if you can pick stocks that are going to have high income growth during the uh, during the the decade, uh, then you've got a good shot at picking the stocks that are going to be in the right tail. Now that doesn't make it any easier, but you know, as I said, the uh, uh, as I said, the the fact that it turns out to be something so fundamental, I found uh, uh, striking. All right, let's talk about CEOs for, for a moment. And uh, I'll admit this particular slide is kind of a, a clickbait slide. One thing I've found since uh, first circulating the paper is uh, uh, people are interested in uh, lists of winners. <laughs> so, uh, so why not uh, spend a minute and give you a list of winners? Uh, so the wealth creation measure that I, that I mentioned earlier, uh, in the early studies, I basically implemented it for each firm, each, each stock. Uh, but you can do it for any subset of months. So if, if you can get sufficient data to identify who was CEO uh, uh, during which months, you can just measure this during the months that, that an individual is CEO and then, and then add them up. And this does require some, uh, some uh, you know, caveats. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that the individuals listed here are responsible for these numbers. Uh, 
there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Uh, presumably the CEO is relevant, but there's other stuff going on in the world. So the, the correct statement is, is this is based on the returns that accrued on their watch. That, that's the way to interpret it. Uh, in any event, this, uh, this data is through 2021. I'm, I'm on the verge of having this updated through 2022, which will make some, some changes in the list. And as I say, this is mainly, uh, mainly just because it's, it's interesting, but uh, uh, you see a lot of familiar, a lot of familiar names uh, there for uh, uh, individuals who were CEOs who presided over or had occurred on their watch, uh, the largest uh, wealth, wealth creation in uh, the history of the U.S. stock market. So uh, uh, Tim Cook from Apple, uh, uh, Nadella from Microsoft, uh, Bezos from Amazon, uh, anyway, familiar names. Uh, but uh, beyond just putting out there some names because it's interesting, uh, you know, I did actually want to pose a serious question to the data. Is it the firm or is it the CEO? All right, so to, to maybe motivate that question anymore uh, a little better, and uh, I picked I picked Coca Cola as my example here uh, uh, before I knew I would be uh, presenting to the Atlanta CFA Society, uh, but it was more because of my two years at Embry and that I was familiar with uh, the Goizueta name and and uh, the the record of Roberto Goizueta. Uh, in any event, here are the uh, here are the uh, seven individuals who have been CEOs at Coca Cola from 1973 through 2021. Basically, 73 is as far back as I could get CEO data, and uh, the wealth creation outcomes uh, during their watch, um, and the percentage of Coca Cola's uh, total wealth creation that occurred during the watch of those CEOs. Uh, so here's also some, some alternative measures of, of performance on their watch, uh, compound annual returns for the company on their watch, uh, as, as compared to one month's T-bills and as compared to the overall stock market. So clearly, uh, Roberto Goizueta uh, did very well by, by any of these measures and, and better than, uh, than the other CEOs that uh, Coca-Cola had had up, up uh, to that time, up to 2021. But there's always going to be random variation. So, you know, I mean, I could pick, I could pick any, any company and list their CEOs and one of them is going to be best and one of them is going to be worst. And, and you know, you'd expect that if, uh, if everything was completely random. So what we want to do is, is pose an actual uh, statistical test of, of whether uh, it's purely random variation uh, or there's something systematic going on with CEOs. So uh, the statistical technique, uh, once again, is fixed effects estimation. And uh, again, I, I mainly think of the year indicator here as, as a control variable, uh, most interested in the other two, the firm indicator versus CEO indicator. Now, uh, how, how is it that statistically we can, uh, we can actually sink our teeth into this? Uh, what I do is, is focus on top performing firms that had more than one CEO. That's where the data gives you enough information to actually actually learn something. So uh, uh, Tesla is not going to be useful here because there's only been one CEO at Tesla, but uh, there's plenty of high performing firms that have had more than one CEO. Um, so uh, uh, what's of interest here is that uh, knowing which firm it is, you know, knowing that we're talking here about Amazon and not General Electric, that matters, particularly in the recent data on that comparison. Uh, that matters, uh, but who who is the CEO matters even more. So this is this is preliminary, and I'm digging further. I'm trying to see if there's anything about CEO attributes that so we can say more than uh, just CEOs matter. For example, looking at uh, which CEOs were founders and which were not. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I believe this is going to be uh, interesting. Uh, as I said, not public yet. Just wanted to give you some uh, some indication of what I'm working on here. All right, what does it all mean? Um, you know, Rex indicated that uh, you know, he's looking forward to some questions and learning the answers. And, you know, I feel reasonably confident about giving answers to uh, uh, questions about the data and the methods. Uh, you know, the implications, you know, I'm not totally sure myself. Um, I have some thoughts about it, but uh, you know, I, I do believe that different people can look at the same data and come to different reasonable conclusions. Uh, actually, there's a lot of evidence that uh, different people have had different reactions uh, in terms of what the implications are. Uh, so I don't pretend to know all the answers in terms of the implications and you know, happy to continue the conversation. But uh, let, me, let me give you uh, some thoughts about what uh, the implications are. 
So uh, if, if this presentation had not been titled some potentially surprising facts about long run stock returns, if I just started out and I said, look, I'm gonna tell you about outcomes to investing in a particular asset class. And in this asset class, the majority of the individual investments lose money. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the most common, the most frequent outcome, the most likely single thing is you'll lose all your money in an investment in this asset class. But there's a relative few, relative handful of assets in this asset class that generate 10x, 50x, or even 500x. And those, and those really big winners that are scattered in there is what makes this asset class worthwhile. If I had told you that, it would have been quite reasonable to respond, yeah, but I already knew that about venture capital. And of course, my point is that uh, I'm not describing venture capital, I'm describing long run stock market investing. Uh, so uh, I think one of the implications is that in the long run, stock market investing has a lot in common with venture capital. And I'll push it a little further. I think uh, this, this type of skewed distribution of outcomes uh, seems to be fundamental to investing in an entrepreneurial economy. All right, second thing, Rex touched on this. You know, the textbooks already tell us why it makes sense to have a diversify buy and hold strategy. Uh, and nothing that I've done here overturns any of what's in the textbooks. As a matter of fact, there's some new ammunition here for the idea that you should be diversified uh, in a low cost way. Uh, the skewness in the distribution says, if, if you just pick a few stocks at random, it's not 50-50, it's, it's worse than 50-50. Those few stocks have a better than 50% chance of underperforming the average. It's the nature of skewness. Most, most individual outcomes are below the mean. So uh, a concentrated portfolio chosen at random has, has a worse than 50-50 chance of, of underperforming. The market premium is coming from a few stocks. How can you be sure you're going to get a few go stocks? Buy all the stocks. Right. So new ammunition for low cost, broadly diversified portfolios. Now, as I was saying, finding these right tail firms is not easy, it's like looking for needles in haystacks. On the other hand, these needles are really valuable, way more valuable than you would have realized if you had been thinking that it was a symmetric distribution of, of returns. Um, you know, we know that a return can't be less than negative 100%. So if you're kind of thinking explicitly or implicitly, you're thinking symmetric, and you're kind of thinking, well, the on the upside is a firm that could double. Well, I'm showing you that there's firms that not just double, there's firms that do 50X, or in one case, I already mentioned it, a firm that does over 200 million percent. Now, granted, that was over 90 years. So clearly, that has the implication that the only way to make money in the stock market is to identify these outperforming stocks, and investors should hold narrow portfolios. Okay, obviously, I just contradicted myself. And what I'm really getting at here is how the findings of this study seem to be uh, something of a Rorschach test. For those who were already inclined to think that uh, the way to invest is low cost, broadly diversified portfolios, they found new ammunition. For those who were already convinced that they should be active investors in particular should be uh, holding narrow portfolios in search of transformational companies, those people found new ammunition. All right, so let me refine this a little bit. And, and if, if you want uh, a little bit more about what, what I think about this, uh, I, uh, the Financial Times uh, asked me to do a, a opinion piece uh, on the issue, uh, which you can easily find by looking for my name on, on Financial Times. Uh, so anyway, this is a slightly reworded version of the, uh, of the prior slide. Many investors should hold low cost and broadly diversified portfolios. Some investors should select focused portfolios. Uh, the issue to put it in, uh, in econ speak is comparative advantage. Uh, 
some people, probably only a relative few, would have the right comparative advantage in trying to find misvalued securities, trying to find those uh, uh, potentially transformative companies that the rest of the market hasn't already recognized as such. Um, so the question of, you know, do you have the comparative advantage or not? Can you identify fund managers who do have a comparative advantage or not? Uh, has to be the central practical question. Uh, and for many intelligent people who are very accomplished and good at what they do, but don't specialize in this, uh, the low cost, broadly diversified portfolio is the way to go. Uh, for a smaller set of people with the right comparative advantage, um, there is indeed new uh, new evidence for uh, uh, in support of that approach. Uh, one last thing I want to touch on. Uh, Rex Rex actually mentioned to me as we were chatting before that uh, there was a there was a recent article that uh, came out uh, after I gave a, a version of this presentation in in Australia, and the headline is Bessembinder slams mean variance analysis. Um, all right, I can't be too critical because I already told you I chose my original title strategically. Uh, you know, reporters also choose titles to attract to attract uh, eyeballs. That's a little stronger than than I would have phrased things. Uh, I would. Uh, uh, I'm a little more comfortable with the phrasing I used here at the top of this slide. Uh, it's a question. Uh, should we reconsider how we measure investment performance with, with a question mark? So uh, let me start with something I think is, is self-evident. Uh, many investors are interested in long horizon outcomes. Some people, many people are investing for a long time. All right. On the other hand, most studies, and, and let me go ahead here and, and be more specific, particularly most academic studies, look at short horizon returns. Uh, most often they look at monthly returns. Of course, they've got lots of monthly returns, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands of others have studied the same CRISP database that, that I started out studying. And they use all the data, but they use the monthly returns. And then what do they do with the monthly returns? They compute averages, arithmetic means, and other stuff like variances. But just to drive home how this is what's mostly done, when you see studies that look at uh, returns to characteristic sorted portfolios, uh, you know, returns for small stocks versus returns to big stocks, returns for high market to book versus low market to book, uh, what's in those portfolios is arithmetic means of the returns, of the monthly returns. Usually, not every study is monthly, but the large majority of them are. Um, you think about uh, one of our favorite terms in investment management, alpha. What, what, what is an alpha? It's the intercept in a regression of returns on factors. What does a regression do? It reports arithmetic averages. The easiest way to see that is if you, if you just ran a regression of the returns on a constant without the factors, it would just give you back the mean. If you got the factors in there, it's still an arithmetic mean. It's now just a conditional arithmetic mean, but it's still an arithmetic mean. Sharp ratios, arithmetic mean in the numerator, variance or standard deviation in the denominator. But virtually all of us who have ever come through a finance course, certainly if you've come through the CFA curriculum, you know that arithmetic means can be misleading about long run outcomes. Uh, yet virtually everything we do is focused on arithmetic means. Now, why is it we're focused on arithmetic means? The intellectual, the intellectual foundation for mean variance analysis, for factor model regressions, for sharp ratios is all in the capital asset pricing model. Uh, some of you might recognize I might be dating myself a little bit here. Uh, alpha is sometimes referred to as Jensen's alpha for Michael Jensen. Go back to Michael Jensen's original paper about alpha. He was very clear about its intellectual foundation being the capital asset pricing model. What's the capital asset pricing model? A model that assumes returns are normally distributed or a little more technically in an elliptical class, symmetric. 
Returns are normally distributed and investors only care about a single period. And the model itself doesn't tell us what that period is. It doesn't tell if it's of a month or 10 years or 30 years. But the implementation is almost always in monthly returns. So the intellectual foundation for all of these measures is, is normal returns and investors that care about outcomes over one month. And not just measured over one month, the model is just a single period model. They invest for that month and then they're gone. All right, that's the intellectual foundation for our standard measures. Uh, I would suggest it's not a solid foundation. That doesn't mean I have uh, the answer to what we should be looking at, but uh, I think there's a good case that we're missing things that matter uh, to long horizon investors. Uh, even, even if you thought mean variance analysis was the way to go, the mean and the variance of 10 year returns are not the same as the mean and the variance of monthly returns, uh, nor are, is it a simple uh, uh, transformation of one to the other. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a ton of skewness and there's no basis in economics for saying that uh, investors should not care about skewness. Uh, nevertheless, it is left out of these measures. All right, I've probably gone far enough and, and I think you know, at least open, opened the door to, uh, to, uh, to this idea that, that perhaps we should be reconsidering how we measure investment performance. So uh, let, me, uh, let me shut down my presentation and I think we have some time for, uh, for Q&A. Yes, uh, got a handful of questions in the QA. Let's start with, um, did you look at the five variables versus different stocks size characteristics, e.g. large versus small? Um, no, no, I did not. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea. I haven't done it. And, and I should mention that uh, one, one of the issues for me in, in doing presentations like this is that I always come out of it with a longer to-do list than I had going in. Understood. Uh, you mentioned other factors in addition to income growth. How did factors such as paying a dividend impact performance? Uh, so another uh, another good question. I, I did not look at the dividend existence of a dividend or the dividend yield. So uh, uh, a good question. Uh, you know, my my gut feel is that uh, uh, dividend paying stocks are going to be lower volatility stocks. And uh, for that reason, you know, they, while they might be really good investments for reasons that you know people as far back as Benjamin Graham have been have been discussing, I think they're probably less likely to end up in that extreme right tail because because in some sense you need you need some volatility to end up over there also. But but, uh, but that's just a that's just a guess. Uh, it's something I should look at in the data. Well, it just is not throwing a technical point on the paper in your wealth creation measure. If a company pays a dividend. At that point, it can no longer have a negative hundred percent return. Correct. 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 Okay. So uh, yeah. So I, sh I should maybe clarify. Uh, I've actually got two complementary ways of measuring long long horizon performance. Uh, the first is is just the compound return, the buy and hold return. You know, which is which is the simplest thing to do, and uh, you know is is easy to relate to. Just the idea of I bought it and I stayed in it. Uh, so so you know it, it's a good informative number. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it does not represent shareholders in aggregate because uh, shareholders in aggregate are not buy and hold shareholders. So in, in aggregate, they don't reinvest dividends because you can't with secondary market transactions. And of course, they participate in all the uh, 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 seasoned equity offerings and, and in any uh, share repurchases. So the wealth creation measure does take that aggregate shareholder uh, uh, viewpoint and, and in some cases, uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, and I mentioned this in the original in the original paper, but General Motors, the version of General Motors that that uh, went belly up in two thousand nine, is is kind of a prime example. Uh, the buy and hold returns were really lousy. If you if you had always reinvested everything in General Motors, then well, you, your your investment went down with the ship. But it had paid a generous dividend and also had share uh, repurchases for decades prior, and that money was out of the firm. It did not go down with the ship. So uh, General Motors actually ends up to being a, a, a prominent wealth creating company despite going bankrupt at the end. Uh, so anyway, for some stocks that, that distinction becomes important. Great, uh, let me mention that Kathy has put a link to the do stocks outperform treasury bills in the chat if you're looking for that. Uh, the next question, 
uh, relates the chart with the one uh, with the year indicator, the firm indicator, and the CEO indicator, saying that the, uh, does it say that the timing of when one is CEO has as much impact as the CEO themselves? Meaning, best to be CEO is interest rates are declining and your currency, mm -hmm. country, are dominating globally. Well, I mean, I think the timing is is relevant, and that's the that's basically what I had in mind in, in including the yearly indicator in uh, in the uh, analysis, uh, with the idea that you know some it's going to turn out that some years are great for the stock market, some years are really bad for the stock market, and I wanted to control for that. So, uh, uh, what what is you know what's displayed there is uh, something about the CEO that goes beyond which which years was the was this person the CEO. Okay. Um, on your slide, looking at the contributors to decade returns, I thought it was interesting there was no valuation measure. You mentioned price to book, but did you look at price to earnings, price to debt, discounted cash flow, proxy, et cetera? How do you think that finding relates to the value factor? Is the difference just a time horizon issue? Uh, so I'm going to, I'm afraid to give a little bit of an incomplete answer there because the, uh, the the original study that I mentioned where I had 20 some odd variables before I narrowed it down to five has been, been a couple of years now. Uh, going from memory, I think the only valuation ratio I had was uh, was the market to book market to book ratio. Um, so so there's room to expand the analysis. Um, actually, I think one of the things that's interesting is, uh, uh, you know, much of the world uh, uh, you know, there's, there's this ongoing debate about value versus growth, usually defined in terms of valuation ratios. Uh, and you know, you can, you can, as you can see, there's there's a lot of evidence and debate uh, on on each side of that. Uh, but uh, I don't view my study as as really being about value ver versus growth, uh, except that you know the the result I showed you there shows that growth in fundamentals matters. But but I think I don't think there's a very clean mapping. You know the phrase growth stock. I, I you know I don't know the whole is history. I don't know when it was that somebody decided that that a stock with a high market to book ratio should be should be labeled a growth stock. Uh, but I don't think it's clear that stocks that are labeled growth stocks are actually stocks that have rapid growth in their fundamentals. Um, you know they're they're in a sense expensive stocks, and, and there's still room to 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 debate. You know is is there a good reason they're expensive? But uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm pointing the finger at growth in fundamentals as opposed to valuation ratios. And what I've done so far suggests that uh, growth in fundamentals is the important thing. Good. How many of the top 100 or 150 performing stocks in the global study were U.S. versus non-U.S.? Uh, so going going from memory, but uh, the large majority, uh, you know, seventy five to eighty percent of the uh, top stocks were uh, were U.S. stocks. Okay. Um, any conclusions about rebalancing? Um, so I, I've got another paper, and if, if you do go to SSRN and, and uh, search under my name, you could probably find it. Uh, it. It's got a title. I think it's Extending Portfolio Theory to, to Compound Returns, where I where I try to sink my teeth into, among other things, rebalancing. Um, so I, I do think, and I'll be a little careful here because it's being recorded, and you know, who knows, might get mad, who might get mad at me down the road, but I think a fair portion of what is written about rebalancing doesn't really make sense. Uh, so what can we say about rebalancing? Okay, rebalancing keeps your portfolio diversified, which reduces its risk and reduces its skewness. Uh, so uh, th those are things rebalancing will do. Uh, you know, if, if, if you don't rebalance your portfolio in the long run, the big winners get really heavy weights. That's, that's why the risk increases if you don't rebalance. So anyway, rebalancing reduces your risk, reduces the skewness. Um, what does it do to your mean returns? That's all about return predictability. If, if there is no return predictability, rebalancing essentially does nothing to your mean returns. Uh, if there's if there's reversals, then re at, at the right horizons, then rebalancing improves your mean returns. If there's continuation, uh, rebalancing uh, degrades your mean returns because I mean rebalancing is basically selling winners, buying losers, right? So uh, uh, anyway, I, I think it's actually really simple and intuitive what rebalancing does to your returns, and I think there's some statements in the literature that are inconsistent with uh, with those statements. <laughs> Um, I'm going to jump in with a question of my own that um, 
I've been thinking about, it's hard to articulate. I think in your paper, you said the average uh, firm life was about seven years. Firms that, so a lot of firms have died since 1926. And my concern is if you were to do the study, you, you did a study through 2018 and you updated, and you updated in 22. If you had started in 1950, not as many stocks would have died. And the percentage of firms that had uh, contributed to the overall wealth would presumably be larger. And if we go to the other end, 100 years from now, even more firms will be dead. And I would think that, you know, we have the, the haystack is just getting bigger and bigger as you extend your horizon. So my concern is that somehow the haystack may be too large. And we're saying that too few firms, as I sit here today, mm -hmm. uh, are really going to be the, uh, the winners. And so that's kind of as an implication. I, do th I don't think it changes where I am, but maybe it overstates the problem. And the yeah, so uh, yeah, sure. Uh, and, and you bring up a good point. Uh, first, let me just clarify something about, about firms, about the seven and a half year life. Uh, so I, I was actually kind of surprised uh, that, that it's so short, although that, you know, that's a combination of things, including, you know, I've got the whole database and that includes some stocks that just listed six months ago. Uh, so, you know, some of them are still alive, just, just only entered the database uh, recently. Uh, but among those that disappeared, it, it's, uh, this, this is rough, but roughly speaking, half of them disappear for the negative reasons that might come to mind, like their share price went too low or some other, some of the, you know, they don't meet a delisting uh, criteria anymore. And those are, of course, really bad outcomes from the investor's viewpoint. Uh, but, but an approximately equal number disappear because they've been acquired. Which, which tends to be a, a good outcome for, for shareholders because there's typically a, a premium in, in the acquisition. So uh, uh, the fact that a lot of firms disappear is, is, is both good news, good news, bad news, but it, it's, a, it's true, they, a lot of firms disappear. Uh, now, the point you, made, you brought up, I, I think is a good point uh, that uh, um, the firms that have disappeared, whatever the count is, you know, let's just say it's 15,000 for, for sake of discussion, the 15,000 firms that have already disappeared as I update the study, well, that, that number can only get bigger, not smaller. smaller. Uh, so that's the reason that particularly in the most recent uh, version, uh, I decided to start highlighting on the number of firms that explain the top X percent as opposed to the percentage of firms. And that's just the sort of thing I had in mind. But when we do focus on the number of firms, it's still declining. So, so I, think, right. I think the punchline conclusion is, is there in any case. Um, and and uh, we're coming up on the... the one o'clock East Coast time. Last question, what is the implication on, of your research for financial planning? Um, well, you know, a big part of the debate is, you know, does, does this alter anyone's uh, feelings about uh, uh, broadly diversified, low cost investing versus more, more active approach? And my guess is uh, all we've really done is solidify things. You know, people people feel more strongly than ever about uh, about whichever view they had before. Uh, we probably didn't move pe many people across the divide. Um, but uh, the other thing, uh, the presence of skewness, I, I think it's a really big issue at a practical level. So let's 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 just take pen a pension fund, and and the question of is the pension fund adequately uh, funded to meet it, meet its future obligations, which of course, you know, there's a lot of debate over that. And, and uh, you know, people, there are probably people in this audience that know more than I do about the details of the calculations, but here's, but here's the point. We use things like discount rates to discount future liabilities or assumed reinvestment rates to, to compound uh, current assets out. But when we, when we pick a single number like that, we're inherently focusing on the mean of the distribution. So you can have a pension fund that's fully funded in terms of the mean, say, you know, based on our projected returns on stocks, we project to have this, this amount of assets available. But the thing about a skewed distribution is that the majority of the individual outcomes are below the mean. Uh, so you can be completely funded in terms of, uh, in terms of the mean, but still be underfunded in most possible states of the world. Uh, one place I just ran into this uh, myself, you know, I'm getting a little closer to retirement age myself, doing some retirement planning. And I just thought I would run some simulations. Uh, and, you know, we all know things like the 4% rule and such, 
Uh, so basically, I ran some simulations, and, and I'm basically saying, okay, I'd like to I'd like to maintain a a, a real uh, level of of uh, consumption, uh, meaning that uh, I need to withdraw more dollars if if inflation goes up, uh, and then I also build into a capital gains taxes. Anyway, I took what seemed like pretty conservative numbers and ran simulations, and I was ending up with shortfalls in a lot of uh, a lot of the individual possible outcomes in the simulation. Uh, and it was partly because of the interaction of capital gains, taxes, and inflation, which is maybe more nasty than everybody realizes when you're getting taxed on something that's not real and, and there's a possibility of high in, high inflation. Uh, but the other thing was was the skewness in, in the distributions. So, uh, you know, I was fine in terms of the mean, but uh, there, if there's a lot of skewness, there's uh, quite a few left tail outcomes below the mean. So uh, I think that's a really big practical implication for, for financial planning and you know, maybe I'm preaching to the converted here about the uh, about the advantages of running simulations to look at the whole distribution of outcomes and not just work with with assumed mean outcomes. You are well, at least yes, we, we are in the choir. Well, thank you very much for your time. Let me make sure, Robert. Do you have any closing comments? No. Uh, hey, thank you so much, Hank and Rex, for your participation today. Outstanding panel. We truly appreciate your time and uh, also want to thank you to everyone who connected with us today. And if you can, look for an event survey and uh, replay to follow. Thanks again. Appreciate all the time. My pleasure. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.